Right, the first reading is Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 to 4. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendour. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long, de long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. And the second reading is Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 49. <clears throat> While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. <clears throat> they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and, blo and bones, as you see I have. <clears throat> when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of boiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send, I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Good morning. It's good to be back in West Street Christian Fellowship, which is a well-known church in um, our office in Aldershot. And uh, we, we know it well. You, you're generous to us. You give to us. You pray for us. And, you, and I think you understand what we do, which is great, because not everybody does. Um, but... Um, I, I just want to thank you uh, for all that you do for us. And, um, but I want to just say something about Val and I. Val and I served in the army. Um, she a little longer than me. Um, and, uh, but we served in the army. She was my boss in the army. And uh, then we founded uh, Flame International together. And um, there are some interesting things about us. First of all, she gets called Jan and I get called Val. Even when neither of us are there and even when they've never met the other person, we, she gets called Jan and I get called Val. And it's okay, we've long stopped correcting them because it's not worth it. <laughs> Because we know who we are and God does, Jesus does. Um, also, we share the same birthday. It's just that Val's is five, five years different to mine. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and the other thing is that I might be five years younger. I might be five years younger. Um, I have a full head of grey hair. Val has half a dozen grey hairs if you can find them. I, ha I am slightly overweight, um, I, um, yeah, yeah, and, 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 and also I go on beach holidays and lie on the beach. Val is slim and fit and goes on mountaineering holidays. So there's quite a lot of difference between her and I. But we have fellowship in the gospel. We preach the word of God. We are one of one spirit 
because Jesus chose us to work together. And as a result, um, we, we, we can work together and we see the glory of God. And that's what's important. So there are a number of differences between Val and I, but we manage them. Um, and our passion is to bring the healing ministry to the nations <clears throat> and equip people to minister to others in order to preach the good news, bind up the brokenhearted, which is what Isaiah 61 was saying, um, to release the captives from the darkness and the prisoner. Sorry, I've got that the wrong way down. And, and to set the captives free and release the prisoners from the darkness. And that's what we do. We, we, inca- we, we set people free from the prison of darkness. You know, when I was not a Christian, I was behind, I was behind prison walls. I didn't know him. I didn't have the freedom of knowing Jesus. The moment I became born again, as I met with Jesus, which I did 40 years ago now in the army, then I was free to be the woman of God that God meant me to be. And that's what we do um, as, as, a, as an organization. We, we, we believe we have the author- we know we have the authority in Jesus Christ, and we see the captives being set free. Can I just give a quick shout out for Burning Issues, which is our magazine, which comes out every four months, and Val's got a copy. One, the talk I'm giving today is uh, there's, it's, it, there's actually a similar one in the Burning Issues, and I will be. There are references uh, to where we the information comes from. Um, but you know what I would say is that Flame International has been um, struggling to get on mi- on the mission field since COVID, and every mission that we do is contested. It's like the kingdom of darkness rises against us in so many ways and the enemy does not want missions to go ahead. And I think many mission agencies would testify similarly to this. It is hard. Mission is hard. Um, We in flame have to make sure we're doing what the Father tells us to do and keep clean hands and a pure heart. And one thing the Lord has said to us is not to be presumptuous. Always consult about every mission. So that's what we're trying to do. So I was given an introduction to a church in Almaty in Kazakhstan. And that was on the 15th of March this year. It's not an area we've been to before. So I said to the Lord, you'll have to confirm this to me. Show me if you want flame to go to this predominantly Muslim nation where the church is persecuted. Um, And I left this request with Jesus. And frankly, I haven't bothered him since that. I didn't bother him since that day. I said, Lord, you're going to have to confirm it. And um, I left it in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. However, on the 1st of June, I was flying out on a holiday uh, to Greece to lie on the beach, and um, and on but on the on that day on the f- plane I had an encounter with Jesus, and I was reading a Derek Prince book um, on the prophetic word um, in the end times. It's the sort of book I read for pleasure, really, and um, and and so and he said and he quoted Matthew twenty four fourteen. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations and the end will come. Derek said it was clear to him that God was saying, this is my priority for my people. He went on to say that as he did this and prioritized this verse in the working out of his life, He found himself in places he never expected to be. Turkey, Moscow, Almaty, Kazakhstan. 
I'd never even thought of Almaty, Kazakhstan for, for two and a half months. And he said, I knew the Lord. And, and at that stage, it like the, the, this word, Almaty, Kazakhstan, jumped out of the page with me on, at me. And I knew in my spirit that he had spoken. You know, it took me all my energy not to jump off out of my aeroplane seat and go down the aisle and tell people that Jesus had just spoken to me about something that I hadn't mentioned to him for four and a half, two and a half months. And actually, I even had to check in my WhatsApp that it was Almaty, Kazakhstan. You know, that's how amazing God is. And then um, I, when, we, when I was, it was confirmation. And then when I spoke to the leaders of the church on Zoom on the 15th of June, which was three months after the day I was given the, uh, given the contact, the, the pastor invited us immediately. I knew Jesus was in it. And what I would say is that Val and I and Flame International, we're committed to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. You know, in the world, we are fast approaching the year 2033, which is the 2000th anniversary of the resurrection of Jesus. And with that comes a host of events and initiatives. Some are being planned solely to celebrate the, and commemorate this turning point in human history, while others are focused on mobilizing the global church to try and reach the whole world in the 10 years between now and then. It was in, and it was in the days following his resurrection that the risen Jesus commanded his disciples to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth to make disciples of all nations. And he taught them, as was read um, from Luke 24 this morning by Mary so beautifully, it is written that repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. In the intervening centuries between that walk on the Emmaus Road with Jesus and today, the progress of Jesus' disciples reaching the lost has been somewhat mixed. Around what apparently, uh, and there are references to this, but I'm not going to give them all, um, around one in three people alive today would identify themselves as Christian. Another 40% are not Christian, but they've at least heard and understood the message enough to have the opportunity to respond. That leaves 28% who do not have meaningful access to the good news. And it's evident that there is a very long to way to go before Jesus' final commands to his disciples are anyway remotely close to being fulfilled. That in itself is the first and most obvious hurdle to the fulfillment of the Great Commission. It's the sheer scale of the task. But let us watch and see what the Lord does in the next 10 years. I believe we're living in very privileged times. And I think we could witness the Lord move supernaturally to, fill, to fulfill the Great Commission. I long to every day for the return of Jesus Christ. And we have a role to contribute to that and share the gospel where we can, whether it's in South Sudan, Armati, Kurdistan, whether it's in Crewe, whether it's in Sainsbury's in Crewe or Aldi. I'm not sure what supermarkets you have here. But wherever it is, we're called to share the gospel. And if we're housebound, there's still a place for us to be praying people into the kingdom of God. We have a mission. All of us have a mission. And... Um, uh, uh, you know, I just want to pray that, would, you know, this, the missions in this church um, are important to this church and it is a privilege to be coming here to speak to you on your mission Sunday. But there are uh, barriers between where we are now and, and a scenario where every person and every people group has been reached by the good news that Jesus has conquered death and hell. And he sits at the right hand of the Father and invites us to receive adoptions as co-heirs with him. There are both 
internal and external barriers and issues to achieving this. And this morning, I'm just going to give a few or explore some of the internal issues which prevent the gospel being preached in this country. Um, uh, well, in the West. You know, first of all, I want to say that Flame is not primarily an evangelistic organization. Uh, but we are a ministry that goes to make disciples in the nations where the Lord calls us. And I think each of us are called to different nations, including the United Kingdom, and as I said, which includes crew, which contributes to the spread of the gospel. While flame makes uh, disciples, we always start by preaching the gospel. Um, uh, uh, but then that's followed by our discipleship program, which can be used to bring people into the kingdom of God. I was in Armenia last October, and we were ministering to about 46 wounded soldiers from the war with Azerbaijan and uh, a place called Nagorno-Karabakh, which, in, in, which, which is in Armenia. And we were ministering to them. We didn't preach the gospel to them. But what we did was we told them uh, about the, the saving and healing power of Jesus through being set free from trauma and we had a soldier with us who'd been in Afghanistan and had been shot in both legs and as we as he gave his testimony and as we taught from the bible about being set free from trauma every one of those men apparently came to the lord jesus christ the majority of them were not saved and that's because jesus was there and we weren't we weren't preaching the gospel. We were witnessing to the power of the living God and his inner healing. And that's what happened. And, um, uh, and one young man stood up. He was about 21. These all were 20, 18 to 21-year-olds. 20, and that man stood up, young man, he stood up and he pointed at us. And he said, those of you that are from afar, you have completed your task. We didn't preach the gospel. We shared the love of Jesus and his supernatural power. That's what we did. So let me look at some in internal barriers. And I might cut some of this short. Val will be pleased about that. Um, any, but, I'll, um, but firstly, in, even in the Christian world, there is apathy and ignorance to mission in the church. A man named Emil Rummer wrote 92 years ago, the church exists by mission, just as fire exists by burning. And he said, there is no mission, there is no church. It, where there is no mission, there is no church. And he said, he who does not propagate this fire shows that he is not burning. There needs to be fire in each of us, darlings. Fire. And he wants us to be on fire in order for him, for, for his gospel to be, to be preached, to be taught, for whichever way we do it, to be prayed in. The Lord, and whatever age we are, he has a role for us in the, in, the, in the Great Commission. You know, the sad reality is, it, is that only a small minority of Christians are active participants in the work of mission. Around one in 7,000 Christians serve abroad on mission. Of course, most of them have supporters who are therefore involved financially, logistically, organizationally, and in prayer. All of this is good, but even among the tiny mi minority serving as missionaries, the large majority serve among Christians with only a very small proportion working directly to the unsaved. And I want to say here that I believe that West Street Christian Fellowship is by far one of the most active mission churches that Flame has the privilege of, of working with. Um, and I know that you have made a huge impact on the mission field, both overseas and in this country, 
You're a missional church. I don't have a mission. I don't have a mission Sunday in my church, and many others don't either. You are a missional church, and I don't believe that you're ignorant or apathetic to the Great Commission. Another barrier or issue about getting the Great Commission completed is the loss of confidence and increasing fear in the body of Christ. Um, in today's world, the idea of objective external truth is being eroded. And the claim that Jesus is the only way to the Father, which we as Christians know to be the truth, is, is not welcome in the world today. The uniqueness of Christ and therefore the truth of the Christian faith is incompatible with the world today and the world is imposing its views on the church. We have to be so careful that we don't get infiltrated by the world. At the same time, it seems that fear is spreading in the churches in ways that causes believers to share the good news less and less, unless you're Joseph, of course. And, and, but, but firstly, the fear of man means that many believers would rather remain hidden than face the ridicule of a society that has a rather low view of Christians. Secondly, the church in many circles becomes more focused on fear-mongering than proclaiming the gospel and loving the lost. Can I say, even here, since COVID, Flame has had difficulty, Flame has had difficulty getting people onto the mission field. Much of it is because of fear in this nation, but also fear in the other nations. Fear is something that stops us. I want to thank you in this church for those who volunteered and those of you that support us. Um, the, the, another barrier is the gospel being preached is the prosperity gospel and a watering down of the theology of suffering. The prosperity gospel has grown in the West and apart from the fact it's straight up theological poison, uh, not to be too dramatic, it spread, it spread has other harmful events, effects. It is a snare that plunges people into ruin and destruction that leads people to, to deception. And we're instructed in 1 Timothy 6, 9 to 11 to flee from it. We saw, that we saw the effects of this in the Democratic Republic of Congo in Kinshasa, Kinshasa, where there was a huge prosperity gospel being preached in the stadium, pulling Christians away from biblical churches. It's, it's a big distraction. But another outcome, and perhaps which is a greater cause of damage, is that if we're constantly seeking prosperity, it brings a weak theology of suffering. When we read through the New Testament in particular, it becomes evident um, uh, that, there is, that, there is, uh, that there is going to be suffering. We should expect to face it. Yet God uses this suffering to bring about our spiritual growth and transformation. In flame, we were pruned during, in, during lockdown. We suffered. But let me tell you, there's greater fruitfulness now. And we wouldn't have changed that. We didn't like it, but we wouldn't have changed it. Suffering is part of our lives. And... You know, the, the final thing is, for the, this is as far as hindrances to the gospel is concerned, is that in the last few hundred years, Western Christianity has been in a position of wealth and power and freedom. And, it is, and therefore, that there has become prayerlessness in the church. I'm not suggesting that's the case in this church. But, our, you know, our prayer life is weak when our bank accounts, our diplomatic influence, medical technology and organization capacity are so powerful. The res this results in prayer becoming a last resort of desperation rather than our first instinct. And that's the problem we face. And we need prayer to, to complete 
uh, the Great Commission. There is a stark contrast in the tone of a prayer meeting where persecution and poverty are the Christian experience and the one where everybody has their lives neatly put together. And when we are convinced that all real growth is ultimately a supernatural process and are prepared to act upon this belief, this will directly reflect, be reflected by the priority that we give to corporate and personal prayer in the life of the church. It's only when we begin to see that nothing matters, uh, that nothing that matters will occur except in answer to prayer, that prayer will become more an optional program for the faithful few, um, more than an optional program for the faithful few, and instead become the driving force of the church. Prayer has to be our driving force, she says. I want to tell you that in Flame International, we're excited because at our 20th anniversary supporters weekend, we believe we were called to greater prayer. And we're asking people to come into intercessory hubs of about three to six people to intercede for the nations that we work in and, 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 where, and the ministry within them. We're excited because we believe that this is the work that the, of the Lord and we're going to be praying for breakthrough um, in the nations and to see the power of God move in the lives of those to whom we minister. We're running equipping sessions um, and we're believing that there's going to be breakthrough. We saw a breakthrough of the Holy Spirit at our, mission, at our supporters weekend on the last session. The, they were all, the, the, the room was full of tears, including men who'd been in the military, including women who you wouldn't have believed would have been crying because God, the Holy Spirit, was touching them. The fire, we believe the fire of God fell. As a result, we are now believing for this, this um, prayer initiative that we're doing will rise up from the grassroots. Now, I want to, and actually... You know, we want to see greater impact of the gospel of, of, for the Great Commission to be preached as a result of that. Now, I'm just going to, if this will come out, I don't know if it will. Oh, yes, I'm just going to move because I want to move to the front. I'll probably stay here. Maybe not. I just want to tell you that while I've been talking about barriers to preaching the gospel, Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit is still on the move. He wants to complete his great commission. I believe we need to be mindful of the barriers in order to pray against the barriers, in order to break down the barriers, in order that we are free to preach the gospel. I want to tell you a story. I was in Istanbul last August, and I'm going again this August. We were ministering to 25 Farsi-speaking um, people um, from different nations, and uh, they were they were all from a Muslim background. Uh, uh, from a Muslim background, they were Muslim background believers, and we took our teaching. Uh, to Istanbul to do that. Now, they, this was in the basement of a hotel. We were living in this hotel and we would come down in the lift. The, these believers would come in the front door and go down the stairs and nobody ever saw us with these people and because we have to do that for their safety. Anyway, so we, we disappeared to go and pray. The next thing we know, we walk in and they're playing, they're doing worship by YouTube. Heather, your worship was brilliant this morning, but it was amazing that YouTube had an anointing upon it because all of them were on their knees crying, weeping, praising the Lord because of YouTube. Uh, you know, it's extraordinary. Then we had a, a Farsi speaker come in from the United Kingdom on Zoom because he, didn't, he's, he was trying to replace his UK visa, so he couldn't come. Came in on Zoom. We didn't have time to introduce ourselves before he got there. The next thing we know, he's talking about shame and honor and putting the word 
word of God over the shame and the shame and honor culture. They're, they're all on their knees weeping, weeping because of the testimony he's given of how Jesus had set him free from, uh, you know, from shame. And he, they're on their knees. So we're praying from the front. They didn't have a Scooby-Doo who we were. Yet Jesus touched their lives that morning. They cried for an hour. We did a bit of teaching. We hardly did anything, frankly. But anyway, we did some teaching. We put them into groups. And I had four ladies in my group. All four of them gave me a testimony of sexual abuse from their families. And I said to them, can you forgive? And to a lady, they said, no, I cannot forgive. So I said, can I ask you to go back to your hotel tonight and ask Jesus what you need to do? And and I prayed for the conviction of the Holy Spirit on them as they went. So I, did, I had no idea because they were adamant they were not going to forgive. Next day, they come in. They're smiling. I didn't get the chance to speak to them till the group time. And then I asked them, what happened last night? Oh, she said, Jesus sat at the end of my bed. Another one. Oh, Jesus gave me a picture. Another one. I had a scripture. Finally, somebody said, Jesus told me I had to forgive. And so I said to them, have you forgiven these people in your family? And she said, are they all? to a person, said, yes. And you could tell that they had because their countenance, which was downcast, was smiles and love and expectancy. Why? Because Jesus had spoken to them completely independently of us. It's lovely, isn't it, when Jesus works independently of us. Now, I'm, I'm finishing now in about three minutes now. And... Um, um, uh, and uh, what I want to say is that, th that mission is still on our agenda. We have to fight to get on mission, but we're fighting. And I believe that, 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 that these barriers can be prayed away. And I, want to say, I also want to say um, it's our privilege in flame to partner with West Street Christian Fellowship because we believe you're a missional church and we want and it is what you do is sacrificial for the mission field and I just wondered if I could pray for you just for the fire of God I've got this thing about the fire of God this morning and um, I wonder if we I could pray for you just for the fire of the living God to touch you. Would that be okay? Is that all right? Thank you, Graham. So if you, I don't mind if you sit down, stand up, put your hands on your head, but let's pray. And let's, as if we're going to receive something from the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. His presence is here. We prayed it. We, we sense it. If you, if you would like a touch from Jesus, he will give you his gifts if you want it. And Father, I pray for the fire of God to come into this church today. We believe that you have a plan for every person, whether it's in, whether it's in Tesco, Sainsbury, at the filling stations, when you're do, it was filling up your cars, wherever it is in crew. It might be on the mission field. It might be out into the nations. It might be further afield in the United Kingdom. It might be the fire of God on the housebound, but the fire of God would come and touch them to put the fire of God on their prayers in order to facilitate the return of Jesus Christ. Jesus, would you come this morning? afresh into our lives. Give us a fresh passion to see the glory of the King of Kings 
and the Lord of Lords and put an anointing on the leadership in this church in order that mission and that the year 2033 will be significant in our times. In Jesus' name. Amen.